Good morning, Estero United Methodist Church. This is Pastor Tim. Hey, I'm pretty excited about February the 6th. We are gonna do live on the lawn out here. Uh, it is a 4.30 Saturday afternoon service. Bring your lawn chair. Now, it will not be replacing our Sunday morning services, but it is an opportunity, particularly for those of you who have not felt comfortable coming to church, to have an opportunity to come and participate live in worship. So February 6th, 4.30, live on the lawn. We're also going to be sharing communion that day, and you're going to get to hear the first message of uh, the Exodus Freedom's Journey series. We hope to see you here. Come on out. Hi, this is Pastor Tim. Hey, listen, if I say the American Revolution, if I say Gettysburg, if I say Pearl Harbor or D-Day or 9-11, you all recognize those as American stories. Those are the stories of our country. Well, if I say Burning Bush and I say the plagues and I say the Red Sea, and I say the wilderness and the promised land. Well, that's the story of God's redemption through the exodus of the Jewish people. That's their story. And the thing about the exodus, freedom's journey story, is that it's a, it's a story that happens over and over and over again in Scripture. And so starting in February, we are going to start not just a sermon series. We're also going to be doing a, um, an all-church study that we would love for you to be a part of, talking about freedom's journey, what it is that God was doing. For example, the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness. Is it any coincidence that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness? Moses was supposed to take the people into the promised land, the land promised by God. Jesus leads us into the promised land. Over and over and over, you hear the story, you see the story, and in fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, I'll bet you've even lived the story of the Exodus, of being set free from the slavery to sin, being led through the wilderness in a time of testing and growth and seeing the miracles and faithfulness of God and eventually will be led to that promised land. So I really hope that you'll come and be a part not just of the sermon series, but that you'll be a part of Freedom's Journey in one of our small groups. I'm really excited about this. See you then. morning. We need to get a better looking guy to do our announcements. That's what I was thinking while I was watching that. I'm uh, Tim Carson, pastor here. I want to welcome those of you who are here in person, those of you who are joining us online this morning. Uh, good morning. I um, want to uh, just highlight again the Freedom's Journey. You can sign up for one of our small groups. We have both virtual small groups and in-person small groups. You are uh, you can sign up now on our website. Uh, all of that is up and running. And also the service, uh, we will have the outdoor service next Saturday. That's this coming Saturday, uh, 4.30. Uh, if you are new or wondering, okay, I've been coming, but it's been weird, which it has, um, let me just tell you, I'm doing a uh, virtual Meet the Pastor. Uh, that's coming up. Uh, and that's this Wednesday night um, at, from 7 to 7.30, and you can find the, uh, the stuff coming up for that as well. If you would just like to hear uh, what's going on at our church, who we are as a church, and we'll be able to go from there. So today we're going to talk about, um, we're going to end this series, but we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of hospitality. Now, we tend to think of hospitality as, hey, I invited my, um, you know, I invited some people over who I already know and I already like, and we had a great time together, 
and I was hospitable. The biblical definition of hospitality, though, is going out and looking for people on the margins and inviting them in. Looking for the traveler, the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, the poor. Looking for them and inviting them in and serving them. It's an interesting concept, particularly to think about it in the same terms of thinking about being our brother's keeper. So think about that for a minute, and let's pray. Well, God, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in this place. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to share what's happening in this place online with people literally all over. And Father, we pray that wherever we are, that you would be with us, that you would speak to us, that you would use these next moments in our lives to communicate with us, to touch us, to speak to us, to open up yourself to us so that we can know you better. Father, won't you fill not only this place, but our space with you, wherever that is, that we might see you and know you and connect with you in ways that are more deep and rich than what we've already experienced. So open us up, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Majesty, worship his majesty. join me in the statement of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Wanted to, uh, as I did, as Pastor Mike did um, last week as well, just uh, thank you for being um, diligent about our social distancing and stuff. We have now four times uh, dodged a bullet of having someone here symptom free on Sunday morning who then tested positive within the next two to three days. Um, And so even if you feel fine this morning, uh, there's no way. And so again, want to um, uh, want to thank you for keeping up with that. Um, As far as prayer concerns, and I I wanted to raise this, our normal pianist, Lisa uh, Dolan, both Kevin and Lisa have had... um, have had COVID and Lisa went to the hospital this morning. And so uh, be praying uh, for them. Uh, I was in a little bit of a rhythm that got mixed up, but I've been praying hopefully for us, then for our church, then for our community, and then for our world. And I want to go back and be praying for us. I feel like it's particularly um, relevant given the, the subject matter we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks of how do we be our brother's keeper. One of the things um, that is apparent to me is that, you know, big changes are going to come as we change individually. And that God, that's how it seems to work. God builds uh, big things out of small things, but a lot of small things coming together. Well, we are those small things. And so my prayer this morning is going to be, and I'm hoping, I'm inviting you to join us, or to join me in this prayer, that God would change me, whatever in me needs changed. I don't always see it, I don't always know it, but there are things in me that need to change. And so, let's pray. So God, we uh, come into your presence this morning. We come in asking you to um, continue the work that you've begun in us. That you would continue to move our sanctification, that fancy word that just means becoming more like you, that you would continue to move that forward, that we would grow um, in, in every way more like you, that our faith would spread out um, like yeast through all the parts of us, that it would affect everything, our attitudes our thought life, our actions, our dispositions. Lord, I know for me that I have uh, things that just trigger me and set me off. Uh, Different circumstances and different things that when I run into a man, it just seems like I go. And it, it, um, it would be helpful if you help me with those. Father, I pray that you would heal us of our trauma. That you would open to us our prejudices. That you would show us the places where um, 
where we've gotten stuck in our thinking. That you would replace, Lord, the lies that we've grabbed onto and believed with your truth. Father, I'm really praying that um, that you would just continue that work in us and clear us out so that your grace and your love and your mercy would flow more freely through us to the world around us. Make us, Father, instruments of your peace, of your reconciliation, of your healing. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. There's no one here to lead the hymn. But we're going to take time to be holy. Would you please stand? seated. I uh, realized when I looked that she may very well have been waiting for me to do the offering part, which I apparently went right through. So um, so offering is in the back and also online, and you know that. So, all right, there it's done. So when I was 15, uh, the German shepherd that I grew up with, who, if you ask me uh, I would swear God was a bit of God's grace to me with fur. That German shepherd died suddenly. Um, she, uh, we think, ate a spring rabbit, got a parasite, had a stroke, and we put her down. Uh, and it was terrible and heartbreaking. I've always had this thing with dogs. Uh, we just connect. Uh, dogs and little kids seem to be my thing. Uh, and uh, dogs become my dogs pretty quick. We went on and got an Irish setter, uh, an Irish setter puppy that we named Danny, even though she was a girl. Uh, Danny, because Danny Boy was my dad's favorite Irish song, and so we named her Danny. And um, it wasn't long before Danny was my dog as well. We just became fast friends. And we'd had her maybe six months, seven months. And I took her across the street. We had a big hay farm across the street, and I took her across the street to run. They had just mowed the hay, and it was a fun thing to do, and, and we were over there. 
Uh, coming back, uh, we had to climb through the fence, and Danny couldn't do that, so I lifted her over the fence, turned around to cross the street, and there was a car coming. And so I was holding her, uh, and it was a real steep little hill that you stood on, and I was holding her. Danny didn't like to be held, and so she was squirming, and I was trying to hold her, and at just the wrong moment, she got her legs on my chest and pushed off and fell right into the path of the car, which hit her immediately. Um, I um, sort of jumped down and went to comfort her, uh, and as soon as I touched her, she snarled, she yelped, and she bit me as hard as she could. I still have a little scar right there where she bit me. Now, I would tell you that that dog loved me. I knew that dog loved me. I knew it. And yet, in her pain, in her fear and confusion and shock and trauma of all of that, she lashed out and bit me really hard. Um, she died a few minutes later. What, um, what I, I keep seeing the world around me, and I keep thinking back to that time. Uh, I keep seeing people who have been run over, who it feels like have been hit by the car of, you know, racial things, that, racial unrest that's been going on in our culture and crazy elections and Antifa and QAnon and insurrections and partisan politics and the pandemic and trying to get an appointment to get your vaccine and all of that. And you keep seeing people who in pain are snarling and biting as hard as they can. And I get it. I do. I really do. Somebody asked me this week, and not in a like, hey, what's wrong with you kind of way, but more in a curious way. They said, you know, some of these uh, topics that you all have been talking about these last couple of weeks are a little controversial and kind of high emotion. Why now when we're already at such high emotion? And the answer, why now, is because we're in a place where it's really high emotion. And what I keep hoping that we can do is recenter ourselves in Christ. Is recenter ourselves. Well, how do I know if I'm off center? Well, if you hear something that you disagree with, and 10 minutes later, you need a Xanax and a nap, you are most likely off-center. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it's probably you, or at least most likely. Um, if you think you know everything about someone by one tweet or post or comment or news story about them, it's probably you. If you spend an inordinate amount of time brooding and worrying and fussing internally over things, if you lump people together or make complicated things really simple, that's us doing that. And I get that we're tired, and I get that we're uh, in many ways um, hurting. And so I think Christ continues to call us back and back and back to recenter ourselves in him, to trust him, and to be his people in this world. We literally, if the scripture is true, we literally are the answer to what God wants to do around us. We are his voice and his hands and his feet. And I want you to remember what happened to Jesus' hands and feet, by the way. 
I mean, it's good for us to say we want to be his hands and feet, but remember what happened to his hands and feet as he sacrificed himself and gave himself uh, for us. And so my hope in these things, and, and it's always my hope, but it's particularly my hope now, that we would be able to recenter ourselves in Christ and to trust him not only with our today, but our tomorrow. And not only with our personal future, but with the future of our country and our world. That we would be able to trust and put ourselves in his hands. Um, and you, again, to kind of go back and recenter, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. You learned this in kindergarten. This sums up the law and the prophets. You want it succinct, you want, you want concise, here it is. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. So today, as we talk about being brother's keeper, I want to address again, again the issue of racism, kind of where that goes and what that looks like. It's a complicated issue. It really is one for which there are no easy answers. I really appreciated Mike's uh, illustration last week of being able to see the blood on the ground. That has stuck with me this whole week as I have thought about that. And let's face it, racism is something in our culture that we have been trying to fix for generations. We had the Civil War over the issue of racism. Now, was it just racism? No. Like everything, it was more complicated than that. We had the civil rights movement over the issue of racism, and yet racism continues. I was trying to think of how to illustrate what I think it is, and what I thought of is when we were in Lakeland, uh, we had planted a church our church was growing, and after about, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, we were continuing on an upward trajectory, and the, and the Methodist church, the next north, one north of us, was in serious decline. And so our district superintendent said, will you all work together, will you form a cooperative parish, work together, and see if you can help turn them around? And we did that for three years. It didn't work. In fact, that church closed a couple years after we stopped doing the cooperative parish. Uh, as I did sort of an autopsy on that time of being a cooperative parish, I, couldn't, I was trying to figure out why didn't it work because good-hearted people trying to do the right thing, a lot of good-hearted people trying to do the right thing, why couldn't we turn it around? And to me, the reason was that it was in their... It was in the um, fabric of their relationships. They wanted to change. They wanted to do things differently. But in some ways, they would, have, they would have had to not be themselves in order to do that. Uh, it was just so deeply ingrained. And while I don't understand everything about racism, it seems like that's the same kind of deal that we have in our culture. It seems that it's in the fabric of our relationships. And while there are certainly some people who are racist, you know, openly hostile racist, there certainly are people out there who are that, I tend to think they're a pretty small percentage. Uh, I think mo racism mostly persists uh, because somehow it's in the fabric of who we are. And to remove it will somehow have to be different. I have to admit, I don't have a lot of cross-racial, cross-cultural ministry experience. Most of my real hardcore experience comes from when I was a youth pastor. I took our youth group, I think, two or three years in a row. We went up and worked with Washington Bible College uh, in inner city D.C., in predominantly African-American neighborhoods and with predominantly African-American churches. So our suburban white kids went and we um, helped promote through the neighborhoods and then put on vacation Bible schools in churches downtown. 
the most significant experience I had in that time was I met uh, all of us were together, the churches we had been working with, and us, there were probably 40, uh, 40 Anglo kids and probably 200 African Americans together. And one of the youth pastors from one of the churches, we were having a time of prayer, uh, stood up and said, I feel like God is convicting me of my own racism, my attitude about white people. And, uh, and gave a very heartfelt uh, word about that and repented. And then I felt like I had to stand up because God convicted me. And I stood up and said something along the lines of, look, I grew up not learning that African Americans were, um, were inferior. I just grew up, the message I got was they were different and they were dangerous. And I should just stay away from them if I could. And I need to repent of that. And that was the message. I don't remember that it was an overt message, but it's certainly the message that I grew up with. They're different, and they're dangerous. And so just stay away. And so while I don't have a whole ton of experience uh, doing this, our friend and former staff member and partner, uh, John Howley, does have a lot of experience and so I want you to listen to a conversation that I had with John uh, the other day. We taped it um, so that he wouldn't have to be here three times, and then I wouldn't go crazy, and we'd spend the whole time doing that. So we taped it. But I want you to listen not only to his experience, but where those experiences have led him with his insight. And so if you will watch the screen. Well, John, first of all, thank you for being here uh, with us this morning. Uh, you have done a lot of cross-cultural work. Um, how have those experiences, first of all, what are those experiences? And second, how have those experiences really changed your perspective on the issue of racism? Yeah, well, it's my pleasure to be here. So thanks for letting me uh, chat with you guys this morning. I have gone to serve uh, my first significant cross-cultural experience. I spent a summer in Peru when I was in college. Uh, after college, I then spent a year uh, living in a, a black community in Jacksonville Beach, uh, working with Habitat for Humanity. And I spent four years in Costa Rica uh, before living and working in Los Angeles, which is a pretty diverse place. Um, so those would be my major cross-cultural experiences. Although, well, I guess I should say, you know, last four years working in Fort Myers with predominantly uh, black and Latino uh, adults and students. Okay. Um, and then how has that changed your perspective on racism? <laughs> yeah, in many, many ways. Um, you know, I think I'll just say a couple of the big ones. Uh, the first thing is really just seeing that cultural prejudice or uh, ethnocentrism is really normal. Uh, it's basically everywhere. Um, you know, I grew up hearing white, black, white, black, white, black, uh, you know, as the major point of tension uh, growing up in the South in our country. Uh, but yeah, I saw it in South America, prejudice between uh, different tribal people in Peru. Uh, prejudice was there uh, in Jacksonville, or really the fallout of years um, of pretty intense uh, segregation and the anger that that created. Uh, in Costa Rica was where it caught me off guard the most, the feelings of many Costa Ricans toward the Nicaraguans uh, and other Central Americans who I worked with. Uh, and even I got to spend uh, some weeks, I didn't mention this, uh, with a buddy who was doing ministry in Korea. And I'll never forget a classroom of Korean students booing me uh, when I told them I was going to go to Japan. Uh, so just seeing that it is pretty normal human behavior to think more highly of my group than the other group. Uh, you know, it's sort of a natural thing to be tribal. 
um, to think my way is the right way. People who think like me and look like me uh, have it right. Um, and I think that's usually something that doesn't metastasize, metastasize um, until there is real conflict and scarcity and you know, that group of people has moved near to me. Uh, and then you see racism uh, or just more nasty forms of prejudice take hold. So I guess I would you know, sum that up by saying it, it is a pervasive human sinful pattern most everywhere. You know, the other big thing for me has been the experience of being a minority in places. Um, and not just like I was there for an afternoon and I was the only white guy, but spending months, you know, basically only working uh, with black students uh, and teachers in Jacksonville Beach and then working only with Costa Ricans and Nicaraguans in Costa Rica, and just beginning to understand a little of what it is to be alone and to feel like I don't understand the people around me and they don't understand me. They have different stories than me. They have different beliefs than me. Uh, I struggle to you know, help them to understand what I even need. Um, and then I think, frankly, to be in places where you're not listened to because you're just, well, for me, I was the only gringo in Costa Rica and I was the white guy uh, in Jacksonville and I was the outsider in those communities and I didn't have their experiences and knowledge and so sometimes, you know, my thoughts and beliefs were sort of brushed aside and that was uh, humbling for me. And yeah, it really transformed how I think about what my responsibility is uh, towards uh, you know, people who are in the minority in my world, where I have the social power. Um, and I'll say on that note, as some of my best moments in those places, or the most meaningful moments where God really touched me was when uh, you know, people from the majority in their community came and listened to me and explained things to me and helped me understand and heard my perspective. It made me feel uh, like not so much of an outsider. Hmm. Hmm. That's great. So from your perspective now, um, what's the church missing? Like what are we missing or lacking or how are we misguided in our thinking about racism. I ask the question because we have a lot of good-hearted people yeah. who, who don't want to be racist, and yet there's still racism. So, so from your perspective now, what would you say we're missing? Yeah, so, you know, I would start actually with a theological perspective that I think is missing in that you know, I think a lot of times we talk about racism with, and this is true, like the recognition that this is an individual sinful pattern. You know, to be racist it, it is to be arrogant, you know, uh, which is completely against what we're called to be in Christ. Um, but I, I think when we limit sort of the scope to uh, the individual sinful pattern, we also miss that being a multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, multi-social class body of Christ is supposed to be one of the fruits of the gospel. You know, so it is fundamental to our witness to the world, to our mission, to demonstrate, uh, you know, the power of God to break down those social and cultural barriers. I think about the power of the first century church where is totally foreign in the Roman world for this multicultural and especially the, the different classes of people to eat together. That was a radical uh, symbol in their world. And I think about how radical of a symbol it would be in our world if we could actually pull off loving across racial and cultural boundaries uh, and social boundaries too. Um, so 
That is to say, I, I think it is mission central. Um, it's not like a peripheral or just like a, an individual discipleship issue, though it is an individual discipleship issue too, but it is like a big picture mission of the church issue. So would you say that it's part of the church's mission to create a church that, um, that mimics the demographics of its mission field? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I think, you know, uh, I, the best, one of the best early examples of this, even I would say to move beyond that, is even thinking about the Apostle Paul, who said, you know, we, the demographic in many of those small cities would have been, you know, uh, more or less the same ethnic group or cultural mm -hmm. group outside of maybe some Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. But he still felt compelled to take this collection of money to Jerusalem to sort of demonstrate the unity uh, between Gentiles and Jews. Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely yes. And then even beyond that, uh, for us to really claim our heritage as like, the global body of Christ. Yeah, okay. So what insights or counsel would you give to our primarily uh, white church that is really filled with good-hearted people who want to be our brother's keeper? How, what counsel would you give us? Yeah. A few things uh, come to the top of the list. I think number one, and you know, I just want to go directly off my own experience that I shared would be, I think as a member of the majority culture and just, you know, to be frank, as people who hold social power, um, I think it's our responsibility or, and really our, our calling is a better way to say it as uh, disciples of Christ to help people who are on the margins or would even would feel I'm not at the center of my culture. I'm not part of, you know, the spheres of power and control. I'm not part of the dominant um, group to make them feel welcome. Um, to do the things I see or that, that, that were done to me to, you know, whenever I can to engage them uh, and, you know, let them know that they're valuable uh, and, and appreciative, uh, to be appreciative of them. And I think, you know, one of the, honestly, just to say it, like, we live in an incredibly segregated uh, city uh, or county, Lee County. Um, and so I think it's on us to be proactive to seek out folks, because if we're honest, most of us don't live in multicultural neighborhoods. Um, so to, to say, where are the places where I could meaningfully engage with and love uh, people of other ethnic groups? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, just to lay it all out there, places like when I'm trying to go to Walmart or McDonald's, um, you know, places where you get a larger swath of racial groups you know, I'm going to try and engage with the folks who are working there or maybe some of the other patrons um, just as a very small way uh, to, to let them know that, that they're valuable and that, you know, they are, um, that I appreciate what they bring to the table. Hmm. Okay. So that's sort of a small thing. I think a big thing, and it goes back let me step back to the question of how we're misguided. You know, I think it's just part of our culture. We're highly individualistic. Uh, and so when we talk about racism, our focus goes immediately to, like, do I personally harbor ill will towards people of, of other races? And I would say that's an important question to ask. Um, and I would say that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, I think just the reality of our nation and our history is such that, you know, we might have never done anything prejudice. Unfortunately, many of our institutions have, you know, our government, our, our churches, especially 
are churches that existed in segregated places. Um, you know, uh, were complicit with what has transpired. So I would say, uh, because of that, know that the process of building trust, it takes a long time. Um, time doesn't heal all wounds, right? That's a lie. Um, so to know that any, any work on healing and reconciling and really working towards partnership it's like a long haul project, and there's no shortcuts. Um, and, and I would say on that note, um, a, to me, um, a way that as a church can do that, or that a challenge that I would give, and this is something that I see right now, is even thinking, you know, how can we support uh, minority ministries? And I mean, New Horizons is a great example of one thing you guys do. Um, they, in terms of other racial uh, ministries, it just, it, here, here's just the blunt reality. Because uh, whites have a, you know, we have a median wealth of 10 times the black community in our country. That's just the truth. Yeah. Um, for black ministries, it's really difficult. Uh, the black missionaries I know have a far harder time than I do, to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. raising support. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, a proactive step that a church can take of, you know, predominantly white folks is to say, you know, how can we get behind uh, financially and ministerially our black brothers and sisters, uh, support them. Uh, and then I would also just throw out and also, just recognizing the social capital that so many of us have. We just know so many people in places who can make things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and using our social capital uh, to benefit uh, some of our, particularly our brothers and sisters uh, who are trying to serve their neighborhoods and are struggling to, to get the resources to make that happen. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Good. Well, thank you so much. That is uh, a lot to chew on uh, for us, and we appreciate your coming and being with us, the experience that you bring, and your unique perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really am. Um, I'm thankful for John. I'm thankful for folks who God calls into that kind of uh, ministry. His sort of uh, perspective on things I thought was just helpful. Uh, I know there are voices in our culture today who would say, if you're white, you're racist, you're part of the problem. Uh, I don't, agree. you know, I know uh, the hearts of most of us. That isn't true. And when he talks about tribalism, our tribe, the tribe that Jesus formed, our tribe are called to be bridge builders, are called to be people who put down those barriers, who tear them down, not build them up. Well, how do we do that? And, and I want to just finish with this idea, and I only have a couple minutes, but I want to finish with the biblical idea of how you do that. And uh, it's encapsulated in this term, which is hospitality. The way that you build bridges and build trust, the way that that happens, is encapsulated in the term, in the biblical term, of hospitality. Hospitality, particularly in the ancient world, uh, focused on the alien or the stranger in need, the one who was oppressed, the one who was poor, the one who was on the social out the prisoner. You remember in the illustration, Jesus says when he's saying, for those of you who are coming in, remember, I was sick, I was hungry, I was poor, I was naked, I was in prison, and you came. That encapsulates that idea of hospitality. That we would be looking for, on God's behalf, the people who are 
around us who were on the margins. It took different forms. Uh, if you were a traveler and you would go to, as you were traveling, you would go to a place, you wouldn't stop at the Hampton Inn or the Holiday Inn, you would kind of wait around the city gate or you would wait, if you were traveling in a Jewish community, you would wait in the town center and the people would come and invite you to their homes and would take you in and put you up. They considered it part of their responsibility to humanity. You would allow people who didn't have enough to harvest. You would leave some gleanings around the edges of your field and you would allow them to harvest on the edges of your field. The story of Ruth is a story of someone gleaning, right? You would give clothing to the naked. You would tithe food uh, for the needy. You would include um, people who didn't fit in your culture, in your religious celebrations. And then there was this inviting people into your home for dinner into your home for a meal. In the ancient world, if you shared food with someone, uh, that was a symbol of sharing life. Uh, that intimacy of acceptance. And as John said, uh, it was a very powerful message to the culture around that the early church crossed uh, racial and religious and class bounds by eating together. Now, they didn't get it all right. Some of Paul's instructions to them are, look, you're screwing this up by separating by those things, even while you have everyone in the same house. But it's a powerful illustration of eating together. Um, this is from... Luke, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, what did they mutter? This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. You're giving approval to who they are. It's a powerful picture. And so when we talk about hospitality in the church, often we're talking about are we helping people feel welcome, yeah, you know, visitors to our church. Sometimes we talk about I had my church small group over to the house. We had dinner together. It was a lovely evening. And, you know, it was really hospitality. No, that's fellowship. Hospitality, the idea of hospitality, biblical hospitality, is you be on the lookout for people on the edges. And you invite them into your world. Widows. Orphans. Folks who aren't in the primary group of social power. It was interesting what he said about missionaries, black missionaries, even in our own community who have a much more difficult time in our very prosperous nation raising funds because of the economic disparity that exists. And so to come back to try to recenter us, it seems like if we could, if we could begin to practice that kind of hospitality, in our own circle. And if our circle is only people who are us, that we could begin to have the courage to pray that God would open our circles a little. God, could I serve you in this way? Would you open my circle a little? And here's what I think. I think if you're willing to be willing, that God will do that. I really do. If you're willing to be willing to open your circle. And I'm not saying 
invite the, you know, you got to invite people over and share the four spiritual laws and preach and hit them over the head with the Bible or any of those kind of things. We talked a couple weeks ago about the LGBTQ community. Listened to a podcast this past week of a lady who came to faith because a pastor, she had written a letter that, or an, an op-ed that ended up back in the Promise Keeper days that said these people should never be allowed to come to our community. Uh, you know, they're terrible people. What, why would you let these promise keepers, these Christian men in our community? One of the pastors from her local community invited her into a conversation. She said, I kept waiting through, for dinner. I went to dinner at their home. I kept waiting for the two things, for the ask to church or the, well, you know, uh, either come to my church or come to Jesus. Neither one ever came. They became great friends. She eventually became a follower of Jesus. Are you willing to open your circle a little? No matter who God calls you to. Because if we are our brother's keeper, everyone is welcome to find God's grace here. Where's here? It's not just our church. Because our church isn't our building. Where is here for you? Everyone is welcome to find God's grace in your circle. Where you are. And if that isn't true for you, then why? And what are you going to do about it? Why isn't it true? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to keep doing the same things and hoping maybe I'll get different results? Or are you going to do the soul work of looking at why and moving forward from there? We are. We have a responsibility to be our brother's keeper. It's our tribe. It's who we are. We have not done it terribly well. But that doesn't mean we can't do better. And it doesn't mean that you can't do better and that I can't do better. I'm way long, so let's close. Let's pray. Well, God, I uh, do pray that you would open our hearts and our lives in our circles and our spaces so that people might find your grace in our willingness and our patience and our kindness and our hospitality uh, to the world around us. Father, open our eyes. Open our ears. Help us, Lord, to be your people, full of your grace to the world around us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to rise and to sing the Lord's Prayer. And then if after the service you would wait where you are until the ushers come and dismiss you, we would appreciate that.
Have a great week.